So first, welcome to panel number five of session two in the 10 to 1115 Eastern time, time slot. And the title of this panel is Interdisciplinary, Multilingual and Activist Centered Anthologizing the 1937 Haitian Massacre. Um, just to give a really brief roadmap of our organization of this panel, for those of you who haven't been in any other panels yet this morning, um, I'm gonna start as the moderator just by reading the biography um, in order of the presenters. And then we have four 15 minute presentations and then we'll have at the end, um, yeah, okay. okay. And then we'll have 15 minute Q at the end. And then I'll just ask that you please use the chat box for questions. And you can feel free to put questions in as they occur to you as, as different panelists are speaking or you can wait for that Q and A session at the end. And the other thing that we ask is just to remain muted if you're not speaking, just so we can make sure we can hear the panelists. Great, and with that, I'll go ahead and read the bios in order of the presenters. Uh, I'm gonna start with myself, which is awkward, but I'll just read that in, in third person as well. So Megan Jeanette Myers is Associate Professor of Spanish and Affiliate Faculty in the US Latino Latina Studies Program at Iowa State University. In 2019, Myers published Mapping Hispaniola, Third Space in Dominican and Haitian Literature with the University of Virginia Press. Mapping Hispaniola considers the ways Dominicans, Haitians, and their U.S. diasporas have imagined the physical and metaphorical borders that divide the island of Hispaniola. Myers is also a co-editor editor, alongside Edward Paulino of the forthcoming anthology, The Border of Lights Reader, bearing witness to genocide in the Dominican Republic. She has recently published on Caribbean literature in journals including Hispania, Chiricu, Confluencia, and Caribe. Further, Myers has an active research agenda in the field of scholarship of teaching and learning and 2019 campus compact engaged research fellow. She directs a global seminar titled Education and Environmental Sustainability in the Dominican Republic, Learning Through Community Engagement and is a co-founder of Border of Lights. Edward Paulino is an associate professor in the Department of Global History at CUNY's John Jay College, where among the several courses he teaches is the history of genocide. Since 2012, he has been a co-founder of Border of Lights. Since 2014, he wrote and has performed his one-person show entitled Eddie de Heat. He is the author of the 2016 book, Dividing Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic's Border Campaign Against Haiti, 1930 to 1961. In 2018, he wrote the script for the Ted Ed animation series called Ugly History, the 1937 Haitian Massacre, which has garnered nearly 1 million views. Between 2015 and 2018, Paulino was a public scholar for the New York State Council for the Humanities. Paulino was also a board member for the Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Cynthia Carillon, for over two decades, Cynthia has led community engagement efforts for nonprofit and for-profit organizations locally and internationally. Currently, she's the Director of Community Development for School in the Square, an innovative education charter in Washington Heights, New York. Cynthia served as the deputy director at the Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, committed to expanding access to legal immigration services, participated in policymaking and community organization from 2014 to 2018. Prior to the NMCIR, Cynthia launched a national youth leadership series, mobilizing and training hundreds of youth behind human rights centered programming as the national youth programs coordinator at Amnesty International USA. On the international stage, she elevated the role of human rights education, facilitating a side event to the UN high level meeting on youth and served as a youth pro producing change coordinator for Human Rights Watch, working with youth activists, activists from across the globe advocating for human rights issues. In addition, she was the partnerships and programs manager for the Urban Assembly, a network of over 20 public schools in NYC, ensuring that over, over 10,000 students have access to quality enrichment opportunities. Cynthia also served as the director of Youth Channel, the youth serving division of Manhattan Neighborhood Network, teaching youth storytelling and producing short documentaries. Since 2012, Cynthia has co-organized Border of Lights. Cynthia received her BA from Hunter College and a dual major in media studies in Latin American and Caribbean studies and holds an MA in international relations from City College. Y como este panel será bilingüe, pueden hacernos preguntas en inglés o bien en español. La última biografía está en español, así que la voy a leer en la versión original. Rosa Iris Tendomi Álvarez es abogada, defensora y activista de, de derechos humanos, cursando másteres en derechos humanos y derecho internacional humanitario en American University. Formación especializada en apatridia e investigación. 
Además, ella es ensayista y poeta. Ella nació en Moca, República Dominicana, y está de ascendencia haitiana. Desde 2001, inicia sus labores en promoción y defensa de los derechos en, en San Pedro de Macorís, creando una red de 26 comunidades o bien bateis, junto a la Pastoral de Movilidad Humana, espacio que le permitió conocer de primera mano la situación de extrema vulnerabilidad y violación de derechos que vivían los migrantes haitianos y sus descendientes. Ella es miembro fundadora del Movimiento Reconocido y también fue candidata a diputada, o bien Congreso, en 2016 por la circunscripción número 2 de San Pedro de Macorís. También es protagonista del documental Our Lives in Transit, Nuestras Vidas en Tránsito y Stateless. Okay, and with that, we will begin our, with our panelists, four panelists, and I'm going to start us off this morning. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about um, this forthcoming anthology, The Border of Lights Reader. But first, I'll take just a step back and talk a tiny bit about Border of Lights, which is a volunteer collective that returns every October in the for the first week of October during the anniversary of the 1937 massacre to the Dominican Haitian border towns of Dajabon in the Dominican Republic and Wanamint in Haiti to fulfill three objectives. And I have these three objectives on the PowerPoint. We kind of talk about these and have for years as this kind of three-legged stool, as Eddie, you always like to say. So one is to commemorate the 1937 massacre by remembering the victims. The second goal is to acknowledge and, and, acknowledge and celebrate historic cross-border solidarity and collaboration between both countries, often ignored by the Dominican government and sometimes academic scholarship. And three, to fortify the connections between the 1937 massacre and vestiges of contem contemporary anti-Haitianism in, Haitianism in Dominican society and politics today. So some of the questions that Border of Lights has asked over the years and that this anthology continues to confront are the following. How do Dominicans and Dominicans of the diaspora bear witness to a genocidal event that occurred more than 80 years ago? And then also, how can we remember and pay homage to an event in which most of the survivors have died and most, if not all, the forensic evidence or human remains was either incinerated, buried, or never recovered? So one of the aims of Border of Lights, and by extension, an aim of the Border of Lights reader, is to provide an alternative to dominant narrative that sets Dominicans and Haitians in opposition to one another and posits them as eternal adversaries. This is a chronicle that ignores a cross-border and collaborative history. So this project, the Border of Lights Reader, which is my focus of this brief introduction today, um, functions as a multimodal and multivocal space for activists, artists, scholars, and others connected in diverse ways to the Border of Lights movement. Moreover, this reader allocates space for these individuals and groups to bear witness vis-a-vis -a, -vis a permanent and widely accessible format. And in this way, we kind of posit and envision the Border of Lights Reader, this alternative anthology, as a type of memorial. So the next few minutes, I just want to go over the organization of the reader, touch on the pulse of the project, and I'll, I'll pave the way for Eddie to then discuss the anthology a little bit more in depth, for Cynthia to expand on Border of Lights, and for Rosa in part to read from her two contributions to the project. So I don't want to just focus on the why of Border of Lights or what it is, but now I'm going to shift to you know, the why behind the, the reader itself and also behind its creation. So I just want to briefly touch on the publication venue, which is open access and our reasons for um, moving toward and searching for an open access publication venue. So first of all, the publication venue, the press is Amherst College Press, which is a peer reviewed and open access press out of Amherst College. And I just have here the goals of the press that they have listed most recently on their 2020 catalog. And they note that they want to increase the transparency of standards and practices and peer review on the part of scholarly publishers. You can see which areas they publish in. And then more importantly, to have an idea of the platform they use, they use a open access platform called Fulcrum. And by doing this, they partner with University of Michigan Press. Um, and this Fulcrum platform allows for narrative to be enriched with multimedia and optimized for long-term preservation and accessibility. So what this meant for us was that we were able to publish audio, video, images, music, a composition, um, all of these different things, these different multimedia sources without any limit, right? So publishing in color, all of our photos in color, we had no limit as far as um, budget went to be able to share these different things, audio, video, as I mentioned. So that was really important to our project. And just for a little history, um, the conversations began with the editor 
Beth Bulocos at MLA, the Modern Language Association Conference in January of 2018. So we're just about to bring it around full circle, um, working on copy edits. And if I haven't mentioned the final open access, free, freely accessible on the web publication will be out in June of this mm -hmm. next year, 2021. Um, so after mentioning that, I do want to touch on how this project relates to similar compilations or anthologies, just to name a few, Transnational Española, the Dominican Republic Reader, the Haiti Reader, um, Matias Bosch's compilation, Massacre de 1937. Um, but it's also different from these volumes. And one of these reasons is because it doesn't follow a traditional print format, right? So instead, this virtual format allows for the reader to fall into the hands of a global public, one that both includes and extends beyond beyond its diverse group of contributors. And one of the goals that we had from the beginning was that Haitian Dominican students on both sides of the border could access this reader free of charge. Another aim that we had in discussing this ideal format was to move away from any type of hierarchical organization of a traditional anthology. And that being said, we really wanted to move away from publishing in one language. So we encouraged contributors to publish in the language of their choice. And given the digital and open access format of the reader, we had the luxury of including these voices in various languages. And thus we have contributions in English, French, Creole, and Spanish. And then relatedly, the contributor biographies included at the end of the anthology are published trilingually in Spanish, English, and Creole. So this unique compilation of contributions spanning well beyond the academic realm and also expanding beyond solely text-based submissions, as I mentioned this multimedia component, is really another factor beyond this open access format that distinguishes a diverse anthology from previous ones that are similar. And then finally, I wanna wrap this up here. I just wanna talk a little bit more about the organization um, and kind of this really hinting specifically to this, this unique compilation of the contributions to the Border of Lights Reader. And I've listed here on the PowerPoint, um, so you can all see my screen, the different sections, and you can see some examples that are included in each section and really just how diverse these, these, these selections are. So by design, the project is multimodal. The anthologies organization constitutes an exercise in, in multi-perspectivism. And from the onset, we grounded our primary goal in this conscious effort to underscore what it means for communities and individuals of diverse genders, nationalities, races, ethnicities, and geographies to bear witness to history as related to the 1937 massacre. So we elected consciously to interweave these diverse voices. So, you know, with that said, the perspective of a U.S. scholar might follow that of a Haitian Dominican activist. The poem of a Dominican American woman might precede photographs of a mural by a group of Haitians that painted a mural in the public park in Monami. So we can really get, get this sense of how diverse these contributions are. And we've also intermixed these varying models of contribution. So there's four general sections, as you can see here in this PowerPoint slide. Um, but each of them really moves fluidly between works by Dominicans and Haitians of the diaspora, those living on the island, and also moves fluidly between scholarly texts, short form activist essays, monologues, poetry, drama, photographs, paintings, um, really interdisciplinary work. Um, so just to get an idea of these four sections really briefly as I wrap up here, the first section titled Bearing Witness, Activists and Academic Essays includes micro essays from Dominican Haitian and Dominican Haitian activists, as well as some longer essays from scholars conducting research in the interdisciplinary fields of Haitian Dominican studies. You can see some examples I posted there on the slide. The second section is titled Artistic Endeavors and also succeeds in intertwining diverse approaches to the 1937 massacre and Haitian-Dominican relations. And this section is really textual and visual and includes photographs, murals, interactive art exhibits. You can again see some examples that I've listed there on the slide. Section three, the penultimate section of the Border of Lights Reader showcases three interviews with individuals who are linked in diverse ways to the Border of Lights movement. The first is with Dominican-American Julia Alvarez, writer, activist, and also the madrina of the Border of Lights movement and her husband, Bill Eckner. And then there's an interview with Haitian-American author and activist, Ebuish Santicat, who has been a supporter of Border Lights from the beginning and you know, obviously a really important integral voice for the US Haitian diaspora. And the final interview is with Jesuit priest and long-term border resident, Padre Regino Martinez Perdomo, who is a tireless advocate for human rights in the Northern border region and who we all feel very grateful to know so well. And finally, the last section is a really unorthodox section that's titled Voice Notes from La Frontera that I think more than any other um, builds on this idea of what you can do with an open access publication venue. So this section compiles voice notes, most of which were recorded in Dajabon with residents of the Dominican and Haitian border communities. 
Um, just as an example for whose voices are included here, you can find the voice of the owner of Hotel Raidan and a pharmacy there in town, um, of numerous border residents and community leaders in a less formal capacity, community leaders. There's also a, an interview, a brief interview with a Peruvian Jesuit, Carlos Alomia, who directed human rights initiatives at Centro Montalvo for two years. So a really diverse compilation of these voice notes, these, these brief audio notes. So just to wrap up, the structure of the Border of Lights Reader seeks to provide an equal platform for voices from both on and off Hispaniola, while also aiming to breach, to, to deprioritize a US-based academic lens. And it also speaks to the bilateral relations between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And we're really looking forward to sharing the open access publication freely with you all in June. So thanks so much for your, your time and attention. I'm gonna now pass the, mute myself and pass the mic to Eddie. And Eddie, I will um, project your PowerPoint here one second. Okay. Thank you very much, Megan, for that great uh, starting off uh, point. And, uh, you know, helping us understand how the sausage is made, how this book came to be, or the trees. Um, what I want to do now is go and talk a little bit about the forests and how the, the reader kind of engages several questions and issues that you touched on, but particularly two for this presentation, right? And as you see here, this is one of the, the, the forthcoming uh, catalog of the press. Um, and what I love about what Alai, Professor Alai Reyes Santos said is that um, it's, it's an extraordinary teaching tool. And th that's what we wanted because oftentimes, you know, we're scholars and, you know, we want, you know, there are certain criteria about publishing and, and uh, I think we're getting back to this idea of pedagogy and using scholarship to, to teach and not just college, but K through 12, right? Uh, next slide. So for this presentation, I want us to focus on two goals that I think the reader is going to participate in kind of this ongoing, ongoing conversation. So first is expanding the definition of blackness in the US uh, K through 12 curriculum sp uh, specifically. Uh, and this definition of blackness is the African diaspora and the Americas. And the second is expanding the definition of genocide to include anti-black massacres, particularly in the 20th century. Uh, next slide, right? So we all know uh, the 1619 project that uh, began, uh, uh, you know, is for the anniversary of the first enslaved Africans in, in, in the United States. And uh, it also became very controversial uh, because some scholars uh, were pushing back at the notion uh, that, uh, that the premise of the 1619 Project, meaning that slavery, right, the central kind of uh, founding moment exclusively, uh, you know, didn't take into consideration other things, right? So there was a big controversy. And I'm not going to get into the controversy here, but just suffice it to say that um, uh, I think the 1619 Project is important. Uh, and I think uh, that it helps in, in maintaining a conversation that is very necessary, uh, particularly around notions of reparations, which I, for the record, I support uh, reparations for African-Americans. Um, but but um, I think the reader does implicitly is expand this conversation. Next slide, please. Right. And that is. Right, what we when we talk about blackness, right in the U.S., right there are there are specific uh, moments and strategies to use blackness, U.S. based, right? Like um, you know Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, uh, the Thirteenth Amendment, uh, or as we saw now, we see now with the new movement, the ADOS, American Descent of Slaves, using it a, a kind of an ethnic strategy, the ways Cubans use kind of political mobilization for political leverage. Um, you know, that's one type of seeing blackness. But uh, for me, blackness is also about uh, the Americans, right? And so uh, interestingly, it began with two African-Americans on the left. Uh, my left is Dr. Ruth uh, Sims Hamilton, uh, the late Dr. Hamilton, 
a sociologist, and also Dr. Leslie Rout Jr., both professors at Michigan State University, and they came up with this concept of the African diaspora to see Black people, particularly, and their history in the Americas at a time when this was not uh, as mainstream as it is now. And um, because of Dr. Hamilton, I went and I studied with her at Michigan State University. And I'm very proud of that of that moment. Um, and also, Dr. Rout, who was also a jazz musician, wrote a seminal book called The African Experience in Spanish America, 1502 to the present, where he goes around the Americas that he plays jazz in different countries and he starts comparing blackness, right? So um, I think the 1619 Project is a way to help us understand and widen the aperture of what blackness is. And I think the reader does this. Uh, next slide. Right? And of course, the Dominican Republic uh, has a trust fund when it comes to blackness. As Silvia Torres Sayan has says, you know, um, Dominican Republic, or the eastern part of what is uh, Hispaniola, uh, the island that is shared, Haiti, that sh uh, shared by Haiti and Dominican Republic, is the cradle of blackness, as Dr. Silvia Torres Sayan said, meaning the first uh, Africans, uh, and not just enslaved Africans, who arrived in the Americas. Uh, were in what became the Dominican Republic, right? And there is an entire history that exists um, that predates 1619. For example, if you go to the Dominican Studies Institute, that has a seminal project called First Blacks in the Americas, and they trace, right? You can see it about First Blacks, the arrival, the demographics, the economy, the resistance, the manumission, uh, women, resources. I mean, it's just uh, an incredibly comprehensive treasure trove of of sources that kind of decenters kind of blackness in the US or expands the notion of what we mean, uh, what blackness is. With, and again, I just wanna say, I'm not trying to undermine uh, the 1619 Project or US centered blackness, specifically of the way we live it in the US. I just, I'm trying to, at a curricular level, think about how to expand the teaching. Next slide. Uh, this is another image here. Uh, so again, 1619 versus 16th century, which is 1500s. Uh, next slide. Right? And we have people like one of my CUNY colleagues, uh, Dr. Elise Acosta Coniel, who's uh, in a small community, uh, a few people around the world who can read 15th and 16th century colonial documents. And here she is behind these uh, colonial primary sources that for me it looks like cuneiform, right? Uh, like chicken writing, but she is at the forefront of deciphering, right? This technical language, but also centering blackness in uh, the Caribbean and not North America. Uh, next slide, right? And of course, there is a, a, an enormous historiography about black people. Uh, in the Americas, and there's literature, there's sociology, there is history. Um, so I think it's important when we start teaching K through 12 history to uh, connect North American blackness with, you know, blackness in the Americas. Um, and the reader again helps uh, to do this. Uh, next slide. Right. Another thing that has helped me uh, come to uh, look at this as what I what I see as the hemispheric perspective, right? I'm taking a riff off of Carl Sagan's cosmic perspective, is my many years as being an AP uh, reader for the AP World History exam and meeting so many high school AP teachers in world history. And it has helped me rethink um, you know, what global history is, particularly with blackness. And I think part of the reader, part of the reader's birth, I think is informed by many of my conversations with high school uh, AP world history teachers. And um, I'm trying to do what historically scholars in college have, have not done is engage with high school teachers, which is incredibly important because a lot of my students are, you know, there's only a year that separates them from high school and me. Next slide, right? Um, again, 
Um, and how do you teach this history? Megan uh, referred to my video I wrote. It's a TED Ed talk. It almost has a million views. And it taught me that, you know, you can use different genres to reach people. It just doesn't have to be the monograph. The monograph is important. It matters. But I think in the 21st century, partic scholars, particularly historians, um, have to engage in other genres to tell their particular stories. And it, I don't think it undermines the, 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 the potency of the, of the story. Uh, next slide. Um, and the second goal that I would like to, to convey before I finish is expanding the definition of genocide to include anti-black anti massacres like the 1937 Haitian massacre, right? Next slide. Right, so I've been teaching genocide. It's the only, believe it or not, genocide course that is taught in all of CUNY, 20 plus campuses, right? I teach the history of genocide course and the history of genocide in Latin America and the Caribbean, right? And um, it's important to me because I'm an ethnic Dominican and my people were part of that kind of perpetrator group in 1937. And um, what I found visiting places like uh, Sachsenhausen camp in north, north of Berlin in Germany, next slide, or teaching uh, the Rwandan genocide where 800,000 Tutsis were murdered by Hutus. Uh, next slide. Uh, or the uh, Cambodian genocide uh, by a small cadre of educated Cambodians uh, to destroy the entire society and going after particularly educated Cambodians. Next slide. Or the Armenian massacre, right, through the Ottoman Empire. Uh, next slide. Uh, all have helped me kind of teaching it every year in terms of seeing and then adding these case studies that if the, our, if the definition of genocide, as you see here, that genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, then the 1937 Haitian massacre and many other massacres should be considered genocidal, right? Uh, next slide, right? So what does that mean? That uh, transatlantic slavery, like the African burial ground monument in downtown Manhattan, near where I grew up, should be considered a genocide. Next slide. The lynchings of African-Americans in the United States, as you see here in the museum in Alabama, should be considered genocide. Next slide, right? And the 1937 Haitian massacre uh, should also be included in this uh, continuum of genocidal violence, particularly massacres against uh, black communities. Next subject, next slide. And I wanna end with this in terms of memorials. Uh, I think we should not only teach this history K through 12 curriculum, but also memorialize uh, these acts to remember and bear witness to these acts of anti-Black violence. And here we have uh, the only, only Black and public memorial in the Dominican Republic dedicated to the victims of 1937. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Eddie. And I, I feel like that's exactly where, um, you know, we pass the baton to each other um, because um, I think that in, when we take a step back and think about what it took to get us to um, create Border of Lights, and I'm just gonna share my screen now. Um, let's see. You know, this is one of my, my favorite images of Border of Lights. Um, this is from our first gathering in, in 2012. Um, it was to commemorate the 75th anniversary. Um, and if you can see, that was that was our, our border, right? That was the, the moment, you know, that was as close as, as we could get 
um, and we we really made it into a, a people's gathering. Um, and it took kind of this this change of narrative um, that that there were people who were interested in, in creating a different narrative from what was was understood about the 1937 massacre. Um, and what I what I really always kind of ponder upon is, you know, Padre Herino telling us um, at that moment who was the the director of Solidaridad Fronteriza, right, around how before Border of Lights, nobody publicly talked about the massacre, right? Like we, we created a space for people to share their experiences in a very public way and not just leave it in, in, in closed in, in kind of like these family secrets, right? But that there was a space for us to kind of come in and share the, the hurtful, the ugly, and also the inspiring, right? How people came together. Um, and so, you know, I think when we think about the reader, I, I'm always really inspired and feel really grateful to share the stage and, and even um, these spaces with, with academics and to kind of also think about how activists working with, with academics, working with um, students and folks all around really help kind of bring together not just a mobilization, but a movement. And I think that's really what um, kind of we're weaving together, right? There are all of these different strands that help us not only remember, but also act upon it. Um, and so I, um, so I think about it too. And as we've kind of thought about our mobilizations, I also think about how the border has changed as well, right? And so in 2012, right, this was our first gathering. And here's a picture now from 2019 of just how much the border has become militarized. Right, and, and I share that just because that it has also made us think about how we continue to gather, right? And just as much as we are kind of pushing for, for change, there is a counter push as well, right? That there is, as much as we're trying to break away the pieces of an existing narrative that keeps us separated, um, there is also, again, more and more push around keeping that divide. Um, and so what has that led us to do, right? I think that continues to make us think outside of the box, right? And all of the different ways that we've come together, all of the different ways um, that we continue to show that solidarity, right? Um, and so again, if you see the, the, the evolution of different activities that Border of Lights has done, right? We've, we've kind of pushed the border, right? And, and if you can see here, here are some, some snapshots from both our first gathering, um, but also, you know, we are seeing the Dominican side, and if you can see on, on the bottom right, that was the Haitian side. So across the river, we had folks from both sides of the island come together, um, sharing their kind of words of inspiration and hope and love, and really making that, that push for a new narrative. And as the border became militarized, our ability to get closer and closer to each other changed, but we changed that in also kind of then circling up, right? And so while we weren't able to march directly to the border or get close because of militarization, we still came together in different ways, right? And I think that even now in COVID times, we are also constantly thinking about how we come together. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of different ways that, that we are continuing to connect with each other um, hear stories, right, um, of how different communities were impacted by the massacre, but also what the massacre looks like today um, in, in 2020, right, and this kind of push again around anti-Blackness um, that, that Professor Paulino had mentioned before. But we're also trying to think of different ways for folks to kind of really celebrate how we come together, um, whether that's through art, through sports, um, and, and just kind of sharing a table together, right, breaking bread. I think all of this is really important, right? And, and I think about what this also means in places like New York, right? Where so often, sometimes people feel like the Dominican and Haitian community are, are on different sides, but so often, you know, we're, we, we do come to the table together. Um, and I think that's what we really want to, again, continue to press upon others. Um, and then I think that art is just such an important and powerful tool in visualizing how um, we are using uh, different spaces as our canvas. And so, you know, we've worked and partnered with 
different groups like Asue, um, where Haitian and Dominican artists come together um, and, and create art on, on abandoned mural, uh, mural spaces, or we do get the permission to also create art that shows how we are connected. And I think that this all just, again, provides another powerful way of kind of this changing narrative, right? It's not just like a few people here and there, and it's not about necessarily uniting the island, right? Which is always what gets kind of tossed in our face, um, you know, that we just want one island, that we don't care about nationalities. No, it's just about, again, uplifting respect for each other. It's uplifting how we can, you know, we do share an island, right? And that we are, we also share humanity and that that, that is, at the core, what we really look to um, support. And so I, I go back to, as well, Eddie, to, to that plaque um, around bearing witness, because it is important. It is important for us to create the spaces where people can reflect, can acknowledge, and can really embrace and use that as a motivator for continued acts of solidarity and, um, and change. So I'm, yeah, so happy to um, pass on the baton to, to Rosa. Thank you, Cynthia. Muchas gracias. Um, bueno, conociendo ya todo lo que han planteado, Eduard y Cynthia, que nos ayuda a entender un poco más sobre la masacre del 37, eh, y todo lo que tiene que ver con, con nuestra negritud. Yo soy una descendiente de esos, de esos hombres y mujeres que pagaron un alto precio en la historia por el color de su piel. Por... Y yo digo, bueno, estamos todavía casi 90 años después, 80 y tantos años después, viviendo efectos de la masacre. Efectos que están presentes en una población de mayoría negra que no acepta su negritud. Y, y algo tan lindo que, que es como tú valorar tu identidad, tu origen, de dónde viene, y es casi como empujarte a, a negar tus orígenes para aceptar el país que te vio a nacer. Y yo creo que eso, eso es imposible, porque... Es, si mi dominicanidad está condicionada a negar a mis padres y a mis abuelos, entonces no tiene razón de ser. Porque eso, eso, eso es algo intrínseco, intrínseco que traigo y traemos cada uno de los descendientes de, de los migrantes. Yo creo que eh, tener esta memoria histórica tiene que ayudarnos a reconstruir y, y a mejorar esas cosas que durante décadas nos han venido separando y, y crean uh, las situaciones tan, tan difíciles que invisibilizan la, la humanidad, invisibilizan el hecho que tenemos eh, y tantas otras cosas ricas que hay en, en lo que somos. Quiero compartir con ustedes un, un trozo de azúcar amargo, que es la, la oportunidad que me dan para construir en este espacio. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, es tan rico tomar una taza de café o de té endulzado con azúcar. Es azúcar extraída de la caña que con su dulce sabor nos anima a iniciar el día, a continuar la jornada o solo recibir un poco más de energía. El dulce que provocó que poderosos económicos movieran miles de hombres y mujeres de la parte oeste de la isla española a la parte este, con el fin de saciar la ambición de algunos enriqueciéndolos con el amargo dolor que dejaba la venta del azúcar de caña. Ese dulce que generó tanta riqueza también ha ocasionado muchas, muchas tristezas. Siguiente, por favor. De este dulce que ha costado sueños vidas suspendidas y al final ha dejado un amargo en nuestras vidas, el estado que detrás de cada plantación de caña tenía un batey, hoy, hoy rechaza a los descendientes de esos migrantes 
negros haitianos. Olvida que llegó a un punto que en lugar de cumplir con su contrato de devolver a los braceros a su país, prefirió moverlos de un ingenio a otro durante décadas, sintiéndose dueño de esos hombres y mujeres negros. Pero no se conformó con eso. En más de una ocasión, sigue con la idea de blanquear la raza, ignorando los propios orígenes de los perpetradores. Creyéndose blancos europeos en un país de mayoría negra, descendientes de africanos traídos por la fuerza de la española. Nos han dividido en diferentes grupos para confundir a la opinión pública y seguir diciendo que somos extranjeros. Eso es lo que hemos vivido. Eso es lo que estamos pasando. Pero mientras más nos dividen para negarnos solución, más no, no, nos multiplicamos en conciencia y tomar acción para revertir nuestra situación. La resiliencia es una de nuestras cualidades. Juntos podemos hacer los cambios de nuestra sociedad. Esos cambios que necesita nuestra sociedad. Desaprender para aprender y abrazar la inclusión. El respeto por los derechos humanos. Amamos con orgullo y sin miedos. Y, y aquí, en estos párrafos, en el primero usted, cuando tenga la oportunidad de leer Azúcar Amargo, se va a encontrar con, con la dura realidad de los hombres y mujeres del bate en su cotidianidad. Y lo digo con dolor porque han pasado más de ocho décadas. Y es como si el tiempo estuviera ahí todavía estancado. No están lo, ese genocidio con las bayonetas, pero sí privando a estos hombres migrantes del derecho a una pensión, de un trabajo digno, de respeto, de garantías propias de cualquier migrante en cualquier parte del mundo. Pero no solo esto, como expresan los párrafos 2 y 3, a sus descendientes. Los descendientes estamos tragando el amargo de ese azúcar que dejó tanta riqueza en nuestro país. Al ser tratado como extranjero, al ser desnacionalizado. Y lo peor del caso es que miles están en situación de apatridia. ¿Cuál es el resultado de todo esto? El que un grupo, una élite, se crea superior a nosotros y al día de hoy nos impidan cualquier tipo de movilización pública de manifestación para exigir un derecho. Nos han puesto una mordaza, una camisa de fuerza. Violencia, discursos de odio. Y me da mucha vergüenza como abogada saber que hay normas que tienen que protegerme en cuanto a esto. Sin embargo, es como si para nuestro estado no existieran. Porque quienes cometen estos hechos de amenazar, intimidar, a alimentar discursos de odio están con las puertas abiertas, incluso aplaudidos por representantes del Congreso para señalar casos concretos. Pero vamos a seguir avanzando, por favor, la próxima. Así es que les animo a leer Azúcar Amargo eh, y todo este, este contenido que tenemos en, en la antología, por favor. Um, y quiero compartirle también un trozo de, de uno de, de mis poemas. Creo que fue el primero en esta, en esta realidad de tener que salir para proteger mi integridad de mi país. Uh, mujer negra, activista, por decir la verdad, casi nos cuesta la vida a mis hijos y a mí. Pero aquí estamos de pies y vamos a continuar. Uh, porque la verdad no, no puede ser guardada. La verdad es como la luz. <risa> donde llega la luz, la oscuridad tiene que huir. Y donde llega la verdad, pues la mentira desaparece, ¿verdad? <risa> y aquí estamos, aquí estamos. Y, y esto fue uh, una de las primeras inspiraciones en ese momento de estar en un país donde la barrera del idioma no, no tenía con quién hablar, pues tenía que desahogarme de algún modo y lo hacía escribiendo. Y de ahí nació Yo Soy Esta Negra. Yo soy esa negra nacida en cafetales, 
crecí entre cañaverales en aquellas comunidades donde aún hay presencia de mis raíces ancestrales. Esa que es condenada al desprecio de cobardes que solo le, les han interesado explotarlo con coraje. Yo soy esa negra que el batey ha parido, con trabajo y sacrificio avanzando en el dolor, luchando junto a los míos. Esos miles que hoy han llevado a un limbo, quitándoles la oportunidad de un nombre y apellido. Y lo peor está que la nacionalidad es un limbo indefinido y no por casualidad. Yo soy esa negra orgullosa del batey, cuyo mayor riqueza es esa gente buena, trabajadora, que luchar es lo que sabe hacer. Seguiremos adelante venciendo el mal con el bien. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Rosta. And thank you again to everyone for being here this morning in this panel. We have about 20, 25 minutes for a Q&A. If we want to utilize the chat box, that, that's ideal. If not, you can also feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question um, out loud, that's fine too. And I can start us with a couple of questions I have if we're um, waiting for some others to come in. But again, feel free to ask any questions toward any, you know, to any panelists in particular or all in general in the chat box. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with Zoom, when you just open the menu there, you should see, if you don't see the option, you can click on other and then chat box and it should pop up for you. And just make sure you have everyone um, highlighted there. Um, that, Rosa, that was so be beautiful and powerful, your ending. So now I'm like <laughs> trying to think of what my questions were that I thought of. But Eddie, I, I maybe want to start with you. You mentioned connecting North American Blackness with Blackness in the Americas. And a lot that you focused on was kind of doing this from a curricular level. You know, so thinking about um, how you would reach, for example, a K through 12 um, level for curriculum and, and talk about these different massacres or genocides on, on, a, on a global scale. So can you talk in particular, since you mentioned your TED, your TED Ed video about how in your undergraduate classics, for example, you teach the 1937 massacre, you know, in particular if the fact that you're a CUNY and you have a diverse student population, you know, how, how do you teach the 1937 massacre in particular to your students? Oh, wait, unmute, Eddie. Sorry about that. I, I would love to teach, for example, a history of the Dominican Republic uh, undergraduate course or intro to Dominican history in Ed John Jay. But, you know, my department in our school has particular expectations. And so, for you know, we have to teach the bread and butter, although that is changing. We're having a really robust conversation about uh, the curriculum being revised to reflect the zeitgeist of the moment and also the students concerned, as, especially as a Hispanic serving institution. So what I do is I, I kind of shoehorn in a lot of you know, my own training. So in the genocide history, I have a whole section on uh, the 1937 Haitian massacre in comparison with other massacres, right? So what I, what I try to do is compare it not just with the massacre in Cuba of 1912 of Afro-Cubans, about 5,000 Afro-Cubans, men, women were, were massacred, but also massacres in Brazil. But also since we are in the US uh, and there's a North American frame structurally, we're in the US system, university, college, I compare it I, 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 again with the genocidal continuum and African diaspora, I connect it with the massacres of Tulsa and all these massacres against African-American communities in the last you know, 200 plus years since the founding of the Republic uh, to make that case of an, uh, that there exist uh, patterns of state-driven and community-led anti-Black violence, right? That is uh, transgenerational and transnational, right? So I make those connections. One of the, And quickly, one of the ways I think we can start teaching this history is, again, scholars not just doing a monograph, but looking at graphic novels, looking at um, at plays. You know, I, I wrote a play and tomorrow, I, you know, I, I'm doing a reading of a play if anybody's interested at 5 p.m. 
um, but to use different tools to convey that story to different uh, uh, to different audiences, particularly K through 12. And lastly, I would say that uh, I would also urge my fellow scholars to collaborate with other people that are not necessarily scholars, right? So this thing that we try to convey in the reader, which is trans, uh, you know, it's interdisciplinary. And the, the word, I, I think you came up with that word for our reader, Megan, uh, multimodal, which I love. And connect a historian with a archeologist or with a literature person or with a musician, right? And I mean, that's I, one of the great things to end in the reader is that we have Juan Colon, who's the Dominican musician well-known and the only person that has written a, a score of based on the massacre, right? And we have that in the reader online and also the, the audio. So those are some of the, some of the quick things. Eddie, and then a follow-up here, Ekur, I mean, and Ekur, if you want to expand, he put here, um, you know, about ideas about transitional justice, if that's something you want to comment on as well. Yeah, that's a great uh, question, uh, Hector. And what I want to do uh, is position it and, and then hand it off to Cynthia, because um, in one of her previous presentations, she had two slides. And I think, Megan, in, this, in the presentation I sent you, uh, there are two slides that Cynthia used about restorative justice, right? So transitional justice, Hector, is very interesting, right? Because it's not like, it's not about seeking justice for the victims as in reparations, right? Um, and specifically about the massacre. In the DR, it's also about uh, what does transitional justice mean for all those victims of the Trujillo dictatorships, the disappeared, right? That they're not connected to the massacre and post Trujillo dictatorship, all those victims with the Los Doce Año, right? The 12 years of the dictator, you know, they, they call it the semi-dictatorship of Joaquin Balaguer, right? And, uh, and it is, it, you need state support. You need the state to kind of write curriculum in the Dominican Republic that reflect these movements that are already going on from people in the Dominican Republic, like, and I just want to shout out, El Museo de la Resistencia, which is one of the most important museums to th that underscore the resistance of Dominicans in the face of fascism and dictatorship. Uh, and it has an amazing exhibition and resources about, you know, founded by Luisa de Peña on the victims of not just Trujillo, but just the Balaguer regimes. And so I think um, transitional justice, restorative justice, Cynthia, if you want to add uh, this, uh, has to necessarily be multi-pronged, institutional, curriculum, public, di popular, uh, po um, public discourse, uh, uh, but also, um, you know, uh, organically. Cynthia? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so yeah, no, I think that this really calls the question around a tr truth and reconciliation process, right? Like where can we come to where people can just really just honor their truth, right? And say what their experience has been, whether it was physically there on the border or all of the different repercussions that has happened, right? And how do we come to a place where we can really think about a reconciliation process that is that really takes into account all of the different stakeholders, right? And I and I think that you know we have seen it, right? We've seen it in South Africa, we've seen it in in many different places, but we haven't really seen it here in the Dominican Republic. And I think it's because a couple of reasons for which Eddie really pointed out. One is that we haven't really fully accepted that there was a genocide, right? We haven't really fully accepted that there was such an atrocity and that that atrocity keeps seeping into all of the different reasons that, that Rosa has mentioned, right? That 90, you know, nearly 90 years after, we are still seeing the work of a, of a massacre and a genocide through policy, right? We're still seeing it through the ways that people are unable um, to access their full humanity, right? In, in, 
unable to um, record births, unable to go to school, unable to all of these different barriers that continue to segregate a population. Right? And until we fully come to that point, we can come to a reconciliation process because we're still in denial, right? We're still in denial that this is happening or that this is occurring. And so I think that, you know, this is why we then have been adapting to all of these different ways to elevate the, the ways that, that um, getting, getting, you know, um, getting into mainstream right, or creating a different stream altogether around the rights of Dominicans of Haitian descent, right, the, the rights of Dominicans of Afro descendancy, right, and, and I think that we have to really find ways of collaborating, really bringing in and, and creating, again, movements, right, I think we're seeing that across the globe around, you know, Black Lives Matter, right, that, that we have to really start coming together and protecting each other and really elevating the most vulnerable because that's the only way that we then have an equal and just society. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia and Eddie. And with a couple other questions in the chat box, I'll come back to in one second. Um, but I also, for Rosa, quería preguntarte, o sea, mencionar que fuiste candidata a diputada en San Pedro de Macorís. Y bueno, la pregunta es si no puede hablar un poquito de esta experiencia. Y bueno, tiene que ver con tu ubicación actualmente en Washington, D.C. y no en la República Dominicana. Y además, debemos comentar que el documental fenomenal Stateless también comenta esta experiencia tuya. Pero a ver si nos puede hablar un poquito de, de cómo te fue esta experiencia. Um, sí, en 2016 fui candidata a diputada por la circunscripción número 2 que comprende los municipios de la provincia de San Pedro de Macorís. Uh, en, en una boleta en la que me tocó el honor de, de ser uh, parte de, del equipo político de Minuta Vares Mirabal, una persona que también sufrió los embates de Trujillo, porque perdió a sus padres a mano de Trujillo. Uh, fue una experiencia en la que aprendí bastante. No es lo mismo criticar todo lo que es corrupción, fraude electoral y cosas que pasan como elector a cuando eres candidato, porque tienes la oportunidad de ver muchísimas cosas más. Eh, y cómo se maneja, cómo se compran posiciones. Ah, pasan muchas cosas dentro del mundo político. Ah, y cómo se juega con la dignidad y la necesidad de la gente en estos momentos electorales. Eh, pero también para el movimiento, para los dominicanos de ascendencia haitiana, fue una oportunidad de medir hasta dónde llegan nuestros derechos políticos. Porque como sabrán, con todo este tema de que nos desnacionalizaron, hay una arbitrariedad de limitar, o si ustedes pueden hacer estas cosas, estas no. Entonces, eh, la, también era una oportunidad de mandar un mensaje a los dominicanos de ascendencia haitiana que tenemos ese derecho político y no solo para elegir, sino también para postularnos, para que podamos promover esas... Deme un permiso. Para que podamos... Uh, eso pasa en vivo. <ríe> Pudiéramos promover esas... Uh, cualidades que tenemos, condiciones para llegar a espacios donde necesitamos representación, donde hayan ideas progresistas. Uh, atreverme a esto, ser parte de un documental que ayuda a que quien no esté en República Dominicana pueda entender la realidad de lo que viven los dominicanos de ascendencia haitiana. Y um, como abogada, siempre tener todo lo mío muy documentado, es decir, hablar con pruebas. Rosa, no te escuchamos. Bueno, yo creo que esto es la realidad de estos momentos en que una mamá y todito estamos en eso, los padres tienen que tan todo. <laughs> okay, make it sorry.
No, we're good, and we'll go, and we can come back to Rosa when she when she comes back from the Emilio. But Eddie, um, maybe I'll pick up. I have a question for you here from Biacari. So, what would it mean to classify or name this massacre and blast and black massacres in general as genocide? So, kind of a question again about that terminology. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I mean, within the uh, genocide uh, circle of scholars, there's a debate, right? Like. Uh, there are people who argue that uh, the transatlantic slavery is not uh, genocide because uh, it didn't have that exterminationist quality about it, right? It's like you don't want to you don't want to kill everyone because then you have no labor, right? But as professors uh, 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 like my colleague Dr. Adam Jones at the University of British Columbia. Uh, has written that's kind of sophistry, right? It satisfies most of the of the of the criteria, and it's, it was such a global uh, project, and, it, and the ramification we're still feeling with today, uh, the policies that yes, and there are many who who support that. Uh, so, but I say that because you know it, it it's it. It's not, you know, okay, so you define as genocide, big deal. So, right, it's not just a question of a group of scholars, right? Like the meaning, it's to give notion to the fact that these lives also matter, right? Um, the uh, but, but then some people argue, well, then you'll cheapen those projects like the Holocaust and Rwanda, uh, right? So we just can't name, uh, we just can't say that every massacre of five people is a genocide, right? Like, I get that. It's true. What I'm trying to argue is when you talk about global history and you talk about the genocidal impulse, that we need to expand that definition without taking away from those very real uh, kind of the impact of these and legacies of these other genocides uh, that are incredibly important for us understanding how human beings go about uh, murdering other human beings en masse, okay? So, uh, and I think, you know, what does that mean, right? That's a good question. I don't know. We're thinking about that, right? What does that mean in terms of policy? What does that mean in curriculum changes? Does it, do you, you know, do we start tinkering with the word genocide or adding to that? Should we expand that? Should we even, in some of my classes, some of my students say, well, can we come up with a different, right? And just quickly, the 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 guy who who came up with the word genocide was a Polish Jew, Raphael Lemkin, who lost most of his family in the, in, the, in the Holocaust. But he started out not talking about the Holocaust, but about the why the Armenian genocide, people have forgotten about it, right? Uh, and so he comes out of a certain particular context where genocide is seen in a certain way. And I think that one of the ways to build upon Lemkin's definition is to, is to anticipate and rethink the unfortunate possibility that human beings, right? I hope genocide will disappear by the time I'm 70, but we know that human beings have a way of recycling the way they murder en masse other human beings, right? So I think it's not just a scholarly debate insular, it's also implication for the broad, broader society at large. Yeah, thank you. I didn't the mention of kind of policy and representation. No sé si Rosa quiere seguir, o sea, hablando nos del documental y, y okay, okay. Sí, gracias. Eh, disculpen por el incidente. No hay problema. Pues, uh, como le comentaba, fue una gran oportunidad poder ser candidata y sobre todo midiendo esta realidad que tenemos como dominicanos de ascendencia haitiana. Um, esto combinado con poder ayudar a que la gente que aún está en República Dominicana, mucha gente no entiende qué está pasando con los dominicanos de ascendencia haitiana, porque hay todo un rechazo a, al haitiano, pero yo, yo digo que es un rechazo un poco, no sé si la palabra sería selectivo, porque es en función de para qué me sirve. Tú no puedes tener un documento por, porque yo te quiero en el batey, y yo a esto le llamo esclavitud moderna. Entonces, comenzar a denunciar esto y, y ayudar a que la gente entienda, mira, es un dominicano igual que tú. Y poner el ejemplo de cuando el dominicano migra a, a Estados Unidos 
que tiene sus hijos en Estados Unidos. Entonces la gente logra entender, oh, no, espera, eso ayudó a que la población se fuera concientizando y que incluso profesionales y otras personas se fueran sumando a nuestras voces y decir, esto hay que resolverlo, hay que buscar una solución. Uh, sumado a que después también nos abanderamos de la lucha anticorrupción en 2017, se fueron dando una serie de hechos que fueron poniendo en riesgo nuestra integridad física. Y de, de, de varios hechos que vivimos, yo puedo señalar que, por ejemplo, un día se llevaron a mi hijo de la escuela. Uh, y eso como este, a pesar de poner denuncia, mostrar las pocas pruebas que uno pudo reunir, presentarle al Ministerio Público, reunirnos con la mi, uh, Procuradora de Derechos Humanos a primer nivel, y que no hubiese ningún tipo de investigación. Hasta que en 2017 se dio un hecho que nos hizo pensar qué debemos hacer. Consultar con expertos. Eh, la idea inicial era bueno, bajar el fin mediático, cambiarme de ciudad, pero eso no fue suficiente. Y ahí vemos los efectos de los discursos de odio cuando no hay un régimen de consecuencia. Y desafortunadamente, para proteger la integridad de mis hijos y mía, tuvimos que salir de República Dominicana, porque intentaron en más de una ocasión de, en buen dominicano, aniquilarnos. Porque teníamos desde 2013 recibiendo mensajes de textos, llamadas, amenazas. Y yo hice lo que corresponde en el lugar, en ese momento, darle parte a las autoridades, tomar la medida de precaución, pero con el paso del tiempo, las amenazas iban subiendo de tono. Y por eso estoy aquí, por eso estoy aquí en Estados Unidos sin haberme lo propuesto, ah, de una manera improvisada, pero ahora damos gracias a Dios que, que estamos vivos y a la gente que nos ha apoyado en, este, en, en esta transición que, que no ha sido nada fácil. Gracias, Rosa. And I have another question here from a little bit earlier from Hector, which I think ties some of these ideas together, maybe for Cynthia and also for Eddie, um, you know, and Cynthia in terms of the organiz or organizing and activist work you've done in the diaspora. Um, can we from the diaspora push for legislative support in the Dominican Republic, you know, and what does that look like? What has it looked like? Yeah, you know, and, and I think this is definitely an open conversation too. I can I can provide one perspective and then would love to hear others. You know, I think that the diaspora here in the United States yields a lot of influence in the Dominican Republic, right? Whether if you think about remittance, whether you think about, you know, we also have a representative in the Dominican legislature, right? With our votes from, from New York, Florida, right? Like that there are so many ways that that we do have um influence and and i think that we just haven't necessarily garnered it enough and really pushed for those that do represent us whether it is within the diaspora or um on the island to be accountable for for these ideals and for the promise of of change right and so i think that there is a lot of work that can be done um and some of it is you know I have met with many different um, legislators, right, and elected officials who are Dominican American. And whenever we brought this issue up, you know, sometimes it comes out to, ay, pero que soy muy complicado, right? And so for, for a lot of folks who stand in solidarity for immigrant rights here, for Black Lives Matters here in the United States, somehow it's very hard to translate that over to, to the island. And I think that's, that's the part that we have to keep pushing and putting pressure on because it's the same value, right? It's the same. If you believe in Black Lives Matter here in New York, if you believe in immigrant rights, then you have to fundamentally also believe that in every other place that, that you are connected to. And so I think that there is a lot of work that we need to show solidarity for some of the, the organizations that are doing the work in, in DR, Reconocido, you know, like all, you know, there's there, MUDA, there, there are groups that are doing that and that need our support, that need our solidarity with them to continue to do that work. Um, and so I think it's, it's very multi-layered and I think that um, it also requires us to make our elected officials who, who are Dominican American or who are representing us also accountable to 
what we see as um, invaluable progress. Y Rosa, ¿cómo tú ves la conexión o bien es como la colaboración entre la diáspora dominicana y haitiana y lo político en, en la República Dominicana? O sea, ¿tú ves esta conexión de la misma manera? ¿O este apoyo tal vez? La diáspora dominicana y haitiana, yo pasa como en Dominicana, está, está dividida. Hay una parte que, que apoya, que tiene iniciativas que han ayudado bastante a visibilizar la realidad aquí en Estados Unidos y en, y en otros países de, del exterior. Eh, y ha sido muy importante. Y, y aquí yo quiero destacar algo. Durante 2012, 2013, esos años de lucha y conseguir algunos cambios positivos en 2014 fue gracias a esa alianza, tanto con la diáspora, ONG internacionales, eh, órganos de Naciones Unidas. Esa presión fue lo que provocó que las autoridades dominicanas dieran alguna señal positiva. Y, y, y esto, sin dejar de lado, el que los afectados tomaran el micrófono. Es decir, durante mucho tiempo las ONG venían denunciando y solo se veía y se desacreditaba el trabajo de la ONG, se estigmatizaba. Pero cuando comenzamos los afectados a dar la cara y la diáspora junto a otras organizaciones a hacerse eco de esto, pues vimos el cambio. Ahora, hay varias preguntas con relación a que si hay voluntad política, que si la justicia... Si partiéramos de una entrevista que le hicieron al actual presidente de la República, donde él incluso puso de ejemplo, si se tomara como referencia la sentencia 168.13 que desnacionalizó él y su padre, estarían en el mismo problema que el dominicano de San Nesiriana, no, no de la nacionalidad dominicana. Eh, en esto podemos ver la necesidad de que haya voluntad política, porque las normas están ahí. El tema de la dominicana de ascendencia haitiana, en que se le ha vulnerado el derecho a la nacionalidad, que hay exclusión, es un asunto de una clase política, una ideología política, porque constitucionalmente estos derechos están consagrados. Es decir, si analizamos lo que está pasando, no son gente que nació de los 10, que tienen sus derechos también, no es que no tengan, pero está muy claro y evidente que el cambio de la constitución se hizo en el 2010 y se aplicó de forma retroactiva, dando a cientos de miles de personas, dejándolas en un limbo. Uh, entonces, las normas están ahí, el derecho internacional es bien, bien claro, lo que falta es voluntad política para hacerlo cumplir. Uh, justicia, bueno, mira, si yo pongo, eh, por ejemplo, justicia eh, eh, en contrapeso político, cada vez que demandábamos en acción de amparo en los tribunales de primera y segunda instancia, los muchachos todos que andaban sus casas, la mayoría. Ahora, el Tribunal Constitucional, las altas cortes, que tienen una línea trazada, son las que han estado dando sentencias en contra. Incluso contra la misma Constitución. Entonces, ahí volvemos al plano de la legalidad. Este gobierno podría casarse con la gloria volviendo sus instituciones a la legalidad, a lo que establecen las normas, restituyendo un derecho que ya tenemos casi dos décadas, que de forma flagrante se viene violando. Gracias, no sé si dejo respondida la pregunta. No, 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 no. Te respondí bien. So we're just wrapping up here because it's son las 10 y cuarto, so we've, we've come to 10.15 Central, 11.15 Eastern. Um, So I just want to thank everyone for the participation in the panel. And we had a couple other great questions. Mayra had a great question in the chat about US government records that you know might still be available but not easily discoverable about the massacre and some conversations with Ekbert and Eddie and Eve had a great point. So if you have a second, um, go ahead and read over some of the chat. And then I also wanted to mention that Eddie, I believe you shared the link for your, um, your reading tomorrow. Um, and there's a yep. few other interesting links in the chat as well. So thank you all for your time this morning, for um, being present um, in this panel. And thank you so much to the panelists, Cynthia, Eddie, Rosa. Um, it's a pleasure to share, share the virtual stage with you all. So thank you so much. And this conversation is recorded. So hopefully we can all come back to it. Gracias a todos. Que tengan buen día. Gracias. Bendiciones.
del universo. Gracias. Bye, bye. Gracias.